welcome to Eat, Drink, Think. I'm Amy O'Neill Hauk. In this podcast from Edible Communities, a network of magazines published in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, we celebrate all things local and sustainable in the food world. Today, we're speaking with Julia O'Malley. Julia is a third-generation Alaskan, a journalist, teacher, editor, and cook who lives in Anchorage. Her work in newsrooms, classrooms, and kitchens explores Alaska's culture, politics, climate, and food. She's presently part-time curator at the Anchorage Museum, writing about and researching Alaskans' relationship to salmon at a time of historic climate-related volatility. She also teaches culinary arts at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Her book about Alaska foodways, The Whale and the Cupcake, Stories of Subsistence, Longing, and Community in Alaska was published in 2019. She's written for The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Guardian, National Geographic, Eater, and the Anchorage Daily News, among other publications. She writes a recipe column called Hot Tang for Edible Alaska, the magazine that I co-publish. Recently, Edible Communities asked Julia to write a story about wild salmon. The result is Alaska Runs on Salmon. It's a look at the five species of wild salmon fished in Alaska, as well as the challenges that affect the fish and those who build their lives around them. Julia, welcome to Eat, Drink, Think. Thanks for having me. We're so happy you're here. Let's start with a couple of basic questions to orient us in our conversation. When people think of salmon, they might think of it as a food, a beautiful red piece of protein on our plates, and maybe not have fully imagined salmon as a being that spends years in the ocean before it reaches us. What's the life cycle of a salmon? That depends on the salmon that you're eating. Most Americans are eating farm salmon, which grows in sort of a pen in that is located somewhere in the ocean, and that salmon stays there. But for the sort of 20% or so of salmon that reaches the supermarket in the lower 48 that is wild, That salmon, there are five species, and they have life cycles that follow the same trajectory. They are born in streams. They spend some time growing up in those streams. So they go from tiny little fry to bigger sort of juvenile fish. Um, And depending on the species, they then go into the ocean for a certain number of years. Could be two, could be five to seven, depending Um, And in the ocean is where they fatten up and grow and turn into the big fish that then, no matter how far they range, and sometimes they'll range really, really far away from their natal stream, they, something signals them to return and they return to their natal stream and swim up it to spawn and then they die and their dead carcasses decompose adding nitrogen to the environment that feeds the surrounding forest, basically. And those wild salmon, you said that 20% of the salmon that people eat in the United States is wild. Would that, and, and most of that, I think in the article you said most of that comes from Alaska. Yes. Most, most wild salmon comes from Alaska. Alaska is the largest fishery that produces wild salmon that people eat in the U.S. And does most of the wild salmon from Alaska feed the United States, or is it going other places too? Salmon does go other places, in particular species like pink salmon and chum salmon. I should say that there are, and over time has been an increasing number of salmon in Alaska that are also reared in hatcheries. So that's sort of a in-between place between the wild salmon and the farm salmon. We might call that ranched salmon, but the salmon are born in hatcheries. They range into the ocean eating wild food, and then they return to sort of like hatchery adjacent. A lot of them are caught, sport caught, but um, they return to the hatchery zone in order to spawn. But I don't know what percentage, but depending on the species, a percentage of Alaska's, of the salmon that is raised in Alaska ends up going to Asia, to Asian Mm -hmm. markets. Yeah. Because of demand, I would imagine, as opposed to 
there being less demand for right. it. And- there's And, well, it's a little more complicated than that. Salmon also can go to Asia and then be, it's a cheaper place to process salmon into different types of products. And then it can be distributed around the world or taken, or distributed back to the United States. But pink salmon is one of the types of salmon that is raised in hatcheries the most, and and that's the largest sort of percentage of the pie that we're catching. And that salmon goes, has there's a market for that salmon internationally as well as locally. But that's what you find in the grocery store, like, in a can. Mm -hmm. Um, But also you might find frozen salmon, like, at Costco, and mm-hmm. it could have gone, and this is also true of like Pollock or uh, bottom fish, but it also could have gone out of the United States to be made into fillets or deboned and then taken back to the United States. But I don't know like the specifics of how pink salmon ends up in the grocery store and where all of that processing gets done. Mm-hmm. Sounds like we have the life cycle of the fish while it was alive, and then maybe there's a whole chain of of uh, what happens to it afterwards that, I don't know, as a, as a cook, do you talk to your fishmonger about that? How do you find out what's well, going on with your... If you're not eating it in a can, it's a lot more easy to figure out. Mm-hmm. For the most part, the salmon that is not canned is going from the Alaska to the market in the United States, and... It is quite often flash frozen and then sold fresh in the market um, or sold unfrozen in the market. That flash freezing does help to reduce the number of live parasites that you might see in salmon. Or it is flash frozen and then sold direct to consumer or in the grocery store freezer case. Um, But it just goes from Alaska to the lower 48 in various ways. So if you're seeing salmon at a fishmonger that salmon has come to you direct from Alaska. There was no stop in Asia. But if you're buying a salmon product, it's harder to know the chain in which it went through to get to where you're purchasing it. And that fish that you might buy at a fish counter, it's not frozen at the time, but it may have been flash frozen before it got to you. Yeah, totally. There's a possibility. And it'll say that on it, previously frozen. But if if you're in Alaska... You know, we often just get salmon that's fresh that comes directly from, like, Bristol Bay most commonly right now or something like that. And as an eater, does that affect how you're going to prepare it if it was previously frozen or not? Oh, there's a lot of opinions about this. You know, and when I'm talking to an audience of people who don't come into contact with fresh salmon that much, it's like seems kind of like fresh wild salmon that much. It seems kind of like splitting hairs, but there is some... There is an, some opinion among people who eat and cook a bunch of salmon that when salmon has been frozen, it changes the texture of the meat because there's like spiky water in that you know water that gets spiky within the cellular you know structures, and then it like changes it, and makes it more mushy or whatever. Or if you happen to be curing it, there are opinions about how well it takes cure if it's been frozen or not, and there are strong opinions on either side because once again. You know, people want to, lots of people freeze their salmon like you would freeze any kind of fish before eating it raw just to like reduce the number of parasites. So there's some people who are like only freeze and then cure, and then there are people who only cure and then freeze. Either way, it's sort of like a small point, I think, in general. So if you as a cook in the kitchen, if you're preparing a fish, you might have pulled it out of the freezer and thawed it out. You might have bought it at the store fresh. But that doesn't necessarily affect the recipe that you're going to make? No. You know, the biggest thing in terms of, like, just culinary, the culinary approach to salmon is there is there is a pretty big difference in terms of the be, between wild-caught salmon and farm salmon, just in terms of how it tastes. And, you know, because farm salmon don't swim upstream, they're leaner because their food depends on their environment, there is a little bit of a different flavor and color. Um, It's so farm salmon is eating like a kind of a fish oil, fish meal pellet, and its color can be added because it isn't, you know, eating the, it isn't eating other animals that contain that color. So like, you know, for people eating salmon in the lower 48, the biggest thing that you would find, the biggest differential you would find is just there's a difference in terms of how the two types of salmon cook and t- as well because of their fat content. Okay. So 
one of the questions you could ask when you're buying fish is where did it come from? And it should be on the label, right? So if you want to be buying wild fish, you should see that. And if you don't see that, maybe you can assume that it's not wild. Right. And most of the time it won't be wild. There's also probably a price difference. I think that farm salmon is cheaper. In another clue is that if the salmon is labeled as Atlantic salmon, there is no commercial, actual commercial fishing in ocean of Atlantic salmon. That fish was overfished by like the mid-century. And um, there are maybe a few streams in Maine that still have a wild Atlantic salmon return. But otherwise, if your fish says Atlantic salmon, it was farmed. I saw an article recently about they're working on, you know, trying to rescue those last little few wild Atlantic salmon. And and there's a scientist who's creating these cold water refuges to like just help keep the temperatures lower so that they can continue to survive in our in our climate. You mentioned that the farmed salmon has its color is is potentially an additive. Yeah. Are there other things that people should know about what goes into it from a, you know, what they're eating perspective? Well, salmon farming is controversial for a number of reasons. The fish are kept in pens. They make a lot of waste. That waste affects the ecosystem around them. They have a really hard time controlling sea lice, so they do use, you know, chemicals to control that. And then one of the larger sort of environmental concerns about in ocean salmon farming is that there can be reasons that those pens get disrupted and the salmon escape and then they mingle with the existing salmon populations. So this happened in the Pacific Northwest and led to a ban on that kind of salmon production. And they, when they mingle with those wild populations, sometimes they're more robust. And so they can disturb those, those populations that are already um, kind of threatened. So those are sort of, and also I think that it does a, use a lot of, it uses a lot of energy. But speaking of using energy, one of the things, there is no way that Alaska can meet the hunger that the world has for salmon. And so another kind of third way of getting salmon is to farm it in tanks on land and to not feed it other salmon or fish. So, And there are a number of operations kind of underway to do that land-based salmon farming. So I think what we're going to see moving forward, and that land-based salmon farming does address some of the environmental concerns, many of the environmental concerns, except for it is extra. It does use a lot of energy, but they're like looking at lots of ways to address that. There was just a story, I think, yesterday or day before by Melissa Clark in the New York Times looking at that. Mm -hmm. And it mentioned, I think, Florida as one of the places where that's happening Mm-hmm. Is it is that mostly, do you know, happening in the United States, or are there other places that are trying out land-based farming? I don't know about other places. I do know that, like, Patagonia, the company that makes the fleece jackets, is also really invested in it. One another one that I think is tied to the Pacific Northwest. Mm-hmm. So I don't know more broadly— it makes sense because a lot there are salmon. The other thing about salmon farming is a lot of it happens outside of the United States, and that's one of the reasons that there's like a big carbon footprint. It's like get the salmon from Chile or, you know, wherever you might be finding them. You have to ship them, and it's a pretty long trip. The way to think about wild salmon when you encounter it is sort of the way that you might think about farmers market produce, right? You can't get farmers, unless you're, I don't know where you live, but you can't get farmers market produce all year round and you might pay a little more for it. Or, you know, there's a certain preciousness to it and it's been produced. You kind of, you may know the farmer that produced it. You may want to support that kind of local agriculture. And that might be one of the reasons that you purchase it. But that's the same with mostly all the salmon you're getting from Alaska is tied to sort of these smaller time fishing operations. Um, and also these communities, many of which are indigenous or have a high number of people who have lived there for a long time. And when you buy wild salmon, it allows for people to continue living in places that are really important to their identity and culture. So wild salmon has this like broad connection to people and place and culture 
And so that's what you're buying besides buying a fish that's leaner and, in my opinion, tastes better than – has kind of a better texture than farmed Atlantic. But you can't always get wild salmon. It's just kind of a special treat, I think. Is there a place or region in Alaska you could describe that might – help listeners understand salmon's effect on some Alaskans' way of life? Um, sure. When I was writing, I wrote earlier about king salmon, um, which has been kind of a lifeblood for the community of pelican. Pelican is a community that has always been built around fish. And I guess as background, most of the king salmon that gets caught in Alaska comes from rivers in the Pacific Northwest. And that salmon, king salmon stays the longest in the ocean and ranges the farthest. And it ranges way up into the Gulf of Alaska. Some of it even sneaks over into the Bering Sea. And so a hundred years ago, you know, when we started to fish more in ocean, this community of pelicans started up. And it is tucked into a cove right on the edge of the Gulf of Alaska. And it is one big boardwalk, and everybody lives on that boardwalk. Um, there's a grocery store and a clinic and a school. Most of the houses are on stilts, and there's a big processor there. And the processor is operated by a family. And, you know, f the environment in terms of just how much king salmon there's available to catch is really changed over time. But that family, because they're able to operate a processor and that processor accepts all kinds of species of seafood that's caught in the Gulf, it then brings in fishermen. The fishermen go to the grocery store and the bar and the tiny restaurant that's been there forever with the same owners forever. And so it's sort of that one pro fish processing plant makes is the lifeblood for this place. And it so happens that the person who operates the fish process, his name is Seth, who operates the fish processing plant was born in Pelican and his kids now live there. And so I guess that would be one example. There are other places, you know, where they're like indigenous villages that similarly people in those villages before there was any contact were living a subsistence lifestyle where they were subsistence fishing salmon. You know, after contact, people got access to commercial fishing after a long time struggle because Alaska Native people were exploited for their labor for a long time in that industry. But they got access to fishing, and that fishing provided capital that allowed for people to buy houses, pay taxes, do all of that stuff, And it, th but they are still living in their ancestral place. So that allows for the cultural activities like subsistence fishing, which is important to culture, not just for nutrition, to continue on. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And can you just explain for our listeners what you mean by subsistence? Subsistence is the most important sort of vector in Alaska's food culture. And Alaska has a strong, robust, and interesting food culture that I think a lot of people don't know about. But the basic idea of subsistence is living off the land is sort of the way that you might think about it. But it is an indigenous concept. And that idea of living off the land is central to people's identity, their sense of the world around them. And the activities of subsistence are sort of the, the, the seasonal activities related to subsistence. So that would be hunting preparing the food after it's been after it's been taken or harvested and storing the food and sharing the food those things are sort of central a central place where cultural values get transferred from one generation to another so and those practices and the values that are held in those subsistence practices kind of halo out into the wider food culture of Alaska i don't know if that was too long of an explanation but the right to subsist is a key conflict that has stretched through Alaska's long history where there's been a conflict about whether how strong of a right people who have lived in this place forever have to subsist versus the right to uh, fish commercially and who has those rights is sort of one of the central conflicts at the center in Alaska's historical since Alaska has been occupied by white people. Mm -hmm. And that might be a good time to kind of circle back to the idea of Alaska as a managed fishery. Can you talk a little bit about that management and maybe 
where subsistence fits in as a priority above or below the commercial interest. And I know that that changes from year to year, but can you talk a little bit about that? That's always a struggle and it changes from region to region. And some, there is management by the federal government as well as the state. And that is both complex and probably boring a little bit to talk to (laughs) you to readers because it's so complicated. But the long and short of it is we continue to have really vexed conversations in Alaska about whose whose resource fish is. And the brightest one right now in terms of, you know, what's happening in the state has to do with people's right to fish chum salmon, in which is what uh, villages on the 2,000-mile-long Yukon River depend on. And the right of uh, Bering Sea trawl companies or trawl boats to catch their species of fish and incidentally catch and waste chum salmon. There is a, not the majority, but a percentage of the fish that is incidentally caught in the deep water trawl fishery. So this would be fishing for fish that we usually call um, flounder there is a percentage of the fish that's in, in, the salmon that's incidentally caught when they're bringing up those flounder that would return to the Yukon River. And people on the Yukon have not had enough fish to fish for four seasons. So, and that without having that fish, you know, communities are looking at nutrition problems. You can't just sort of ship in extra food to those communities. They have um, cultural practices that they cannot do. So there's a ton at stake for those communities, which are indigenous, which practice subsistence on the river. Meanwhile, the trawl fishery says, well, we the amount of fish that we're allowed to catch incidentally is set by the government and the government still says that's fine. And there is pressure on the government to reset or at least limit because there isn't actually a limit um, on how much uh, chum salmon is being caught. There's pressure on the government to do that, but so far the government is not adjusting. At least I think that's what where we're at in the story I most recently read in the Anchorage Daily News this week. Um, but that would be a kind of a way to explain one of those kinds of conflicts. Mm-hmm. And um, by government in this case, you mean federal government? The federal government, right. NOAA. Yeah. I think what, what that highlights really is the interconnectedness of the different needs of, you know, flounder, which is in the ocean, completely disconnected from the people who have been depending on chum salmon for generations. And yet, you know, there's this friction. And I think that it is interesting to consider what are the pulls, what are the pulls on whatever it is we put on our plate. So I, I, thanks for for highlighting that. Yeah. I mean, don't even get me started on Pollock, which is totally interesting to me too. But the wrinkle in all that is that indigenous, there are indigenous groups that are invested in Bering Sea fishing that are different to than the indigenous groups that are invested in continuing subsistence practice on the Yukon. And the Bering Sea indigenous communities are invested in fishing. And without that investment, it threatens their communities. So it's pretty complicated. At the root of it is that the entire pie is growing smaller. There are just not as many fish and the fish are not as big as they used to be. Um, And that is just what is happening. And have scientists told us why those fish are smaller and their fish are fewer? Well, what fish do you want to talk about? We got crabs, right. we got halibut, you know. Well, I guess I was thinking salmon, obviously. But <laughs> <laughs> but with salmon, it is complex. You know, when we talk about king salmon, for example, which is like kind of the big, the most stark example of fish that are getting smaller and fewer, we have been selecting the largest fish to fish. We also have a really robust sport fishery. And so we have been catching and not returning the largest fish for a really long time. So there's that. And so that probably has an impact. There are more hatchery fish than there used to be of other species. So those fish may be competing with the wild salmon and those fish are quite robust and they may be eating some more, they may be eating what that salmon wants to eat. 
there what there are like in river problems for salmon because the water is warmer they they are more susceptible to parasites um, and the parasites are more frequently killing them before they can spawn climate change is um, causing there to be these large rains and the rains create these big rushes of water that wash out the rot, that wash out the eggs we have been protecting marine mammals this is actually a pretty significant vector we've been protecting marine mammals for 40 years with the marine mammal protection act and now there are more predators in the ocean than ever. And those predators are eating salmon, which are compromised in all these other ways. So there's like a wide variety of reasons. And also we know that the ocean temperatures are different and that um, changes the type of species of different um, small fish and crustaceans that salmon eat. It's like a big list of challenges. <laughs> but a lot of them are related to climate. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us, actually, before we get there, I, I wonder if it's worthwhile to mention basically where the largest number of wild salmon come from in Alaska? Yeah, the fish that most people will see or saw last summer would have been red salmon from Bristol Bay. And right that region, which is the largest red salmon fishery in the world, has had like kind of an incredible boom, which is also linked to climate change. Um, so that would be probably where most of the salmon, most of the salmon that you would see is red. Most of that red salmon comes from Bristol Bay. Mm -hmm. And that community, it kind of changes over the course of that season, right? Right. So Bristol Bay sort of like, it has a number of communities there like Dillingham and Naknek. And those communities are sleepy, villagey places, except for about six weeks of the summer, maybe less of the summer, when a deluge of fish processing workers and fishermen from kind of all over the place come to fish that wild salmon, wild red salmon. And that's been the tradition forever. Mm -hmm. Since That's been the tradition since we started to commercial fish in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And... Does it seem like that is a trajectory, that increase in volume of fish is a trajectory that's going to continue, or are there other pressures on on that? I don't think people really know. You know, fishermen are superstitious, so they're all kind of, like, weirded out by it. But just for background, we've had these, like, incredible record catches of red salmon. And so the abundance of salmon is really high. The size of the salmon is not. It's small. Those salmon, just like everywhere else, are getting smaller. The science links that abundance to the sort of warmer, friendlier conditions for what salmon eat in the Lakes and uh, rivers and streams where those fish come from, one of the reasons why Bristol Bay is such a rich salmon sort of uh, hatchery ground <laughs> is because, they're not hatcheries, salmon nursery would be the better word, is because there's such a variety of places where those eggs are laid and then they hatch. And it's also the habitat is completely untouched. But because it's like do they're, those baby fish are doing so good and lots and lots of them are making it out into the ocean, they're just more of them. The thing is, is that the ecosystem can only handle so much biomass. So, you know, it's just an open question. Like if we have more salmon than we've ever had before, like – what then happens? Like, what is the impact then? And weird stuff's happened in Bristol Bay. Like, I was out there in 2019 when the temperatures were record high and the fish were uh, not making it. it the, the streams are too warm for the fish and they weren't able to travel up them in some places. And it's it's really spotty depending on where in Bristol Bay you are, like where the real abundance is coming from and other places aren't doing so well. And kings or Chinook salmon are not doing so well. So, you know, it's not like an easy to explain picture. Um, it's a complex picture, but right now we are seeing a tremendous abundance. We just, I don't really know what that looks like over time. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us more about the Pacific salmon species, the different species that we might find at the store and maybe a little bit about the seasonality of wild salmon? In every region, the timing of the runs is a little bit different. But in general, probably the first fish that you might see would come from the Copper River. Um, and those 
that is a kind of a Gulf of Alaska fishery and the fish would be red and king. And that used to be a big deal. And we would like fly the first fish down to Seattle and a chef would receive it, that kind of thing. And that fishery has become much more variable. Um, but that would be the beginning of the season. And then there is this kind of big rush of red salmon returning. And you would find those, you know, all around the state, but you'd find them in the grocery store sort of starting in June. And that red salmon sort of season, it red and some king salmon season kind of like continues on um, throughout the summer, kind of petering out in July. Um, and then toward the fall, I think you start to see more coho or silver salmon. And coho is like a less appreciated or understood salmon, but it's a lean, lighter fleshed, milder flavored salmon. So red salmon has that bright red flesh um, and it has a little bit of a more intense or brinier flavor. And then king salmon, which you can usually get kind of year round actually, but king salmon is a larger filet. The flesh is a little bit different color um, it has a little more fat. It's a fattier fish, so you can see those bands of fat. And and also, you know, it, it just, um, it's a richer sort of fish. And then you can, it's starting to be caught more common to see in lower 48 in particular, um, sort of unidentified salmon fillets that you might find like in the freezer section at Costco. And that is um, chum salmon, which is sometimes called kita. And it is a very mild fish without that much fat. Alaskans tend to turn up their nose at it and be snobby about it because it, there was a time when it was highly available and people would feed it to dogs. So there's that, you know, that sort of thing. But but kita, which is now when you catch it in the ocean, is bright and beautiful and kind of fine, takes marinade really well, and it's making its way into lots of markets into um, sort of commissary style kitchen environments. So like college dining rooms and things like that. So that would be another kind of wild salmon. And then pink salmon, I think you're mostly going to encounter canned. And that salmon is uh, lucrative to catch. It is a robust fish. It's smaller than the other species. I don't know how often you're going to find, if ever, you're going to find that in like a fresh fish counter, but you might you might find it as like a frozen filet product. Maybe in like a salmon patty or something like that. Oh, yeah, That's totally. Cool, yes, good. Yeah. Yes, exactly. As a recipe developer, do you use the different species differently? Yes and no, I suppose. I tend to use a lot of red salmon because it's much, much, it's so available. Um, and I'm often, I'm usually only writing recipes for Alaskans. If I was, I've been really super curious and wanting to write about chum and how you prepare it. I think chum is a really good smoking fish. Um, and this is this does not really apply to places where everyone is not smoking fish. Alaskans smoke a lot of fish. So I would maybe use that um, if I was going to have a recipe involving smoking salmon. And then that pink can salmon has a ton of applications. You can use it kind of anywhere. You can make like a tuna noodle casserole out of it. You can make it into fish pie, which is like commonly made here. You know, anything where you would use sort of like a, a ground salmon that sort of comes in to play. Alaskans like pretty much never. I just don't know how often we're buying canned salmon like that. We must be because I see it at the store, but I think most Alaskans have access to it relatively low cost, you know, fresh caught wild salmon, but. Or maybe they've canned it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. And then there's also that, although I think that stuff's so special, you probably wouldn't be, I don't know how much you would be like, I don't know, maybe making it into fish patties or something. But the thing about freezing, I will say is that frozen salmon that is li like in the freezer for a while is a really entirely different thing than fresh salmon that hasn't been frozen or was flash flash frozen you know so for consumers that are like buying a costco pack of chum or kita that fish is like gonna be a way different than even if you were to catch freshly catch that chum salmon you know and then like flash flash freeze it and then cook it or whatever um it's kind of a whole different thing. So are you seeing flash frozen Kita at Costco? 
Yeah, for sure. It's there. Cool. Saw it. With my own two eyes. Awesome. Um, yeah, and I went out over the su- over the summer, and I caught a bunch of chum. Like I went on a commercial fishing boat and caught a bunch of chum, and it was going all over the place in Lower Forty Eight. So I do think Lower Forty Eight consumers are seeing that more. And do you have a favorite way of using canned salmon? I like to make fish pie. I think it's a cool way to use fish. I use also like my older frozen salmon for that too, but I I'm a big so fish pie came to Alaska with the Russian occupation and has been adopted in different regions and made differently in different regions around the coastal part of the state. The way that I like to make it is, you know, the traditional way to make it involves like boiled eggs and um, rice and vegetables. But um, I like to make it with like a like a thyme Parmesan crust and I leave the boiled eggs out. So it's kind of like a fish pot pie vibe. Mm-hmm. And do you have recommendations for cooks who are shopping for wild salmon? Are there questions that they should ask or things that they should look for both at the fish counter or in the freezer? Well, the best, if you're going to do it, you might as well try to get it pretty fresh. That's one thing I would say. It's like uh, you might as well just invest in that and make it special. Um, I think that um, when you cook it, it's really easy to overcook. That I think the number seven is a good one to keep in mind when you're thinking about how long should you have a filet in a heat in a heated environment. So whether that's grilled or in the oven, I think seven minutes is like when you should start thinking about taking that fish out. Um, I think the less you do to fresh salmon, kind of the better. If you have a piece of fresh salmon, you should grill it with salt and pepper and maybe some lemon and just call it good. That is the way Alaskans do it. So I guess that would be my advice. Um, if you're going to make salmon into patties, you should use canned salmon. You know, and if you're if you're gonna pro- you know if you're gonna process it in a way where you can't recognize the fillet, I don't know that it, that you know somebody might come and kill me over this, but like I don't know that it matters whether it's fresh or farmed at that point because salmon is it basically just turns into protein at that point. Um, so. That's kind of my opinion. If it, it's just it's precious, and if you're gonna just like flake it up and barely taste it, tuna casserole style, I don't know if it's necessary <laughs> to like go to the store and buy a pay a lot for a fresh fillet. But that's my opinion. And you talked about the connection, the farmers market sort of connection right. and the seasonal connection. So, do you think of it as a summer food? Yes, I do. I do. I mean, I think of it as a summer food, and then. When I eat it in the winter, I re- I sort of start, okay, there's like a period when I start taking out fillets and then coming up with concoctions to put on top of them while I bake them because I'm no longer using my grill. So that's when I'm like crushing up potato chips and painting them with Kewpie mayo. And like, that's good too. And I'm not ashamed and you should all try it. Um, and then as we get into after January, that's when I'm like, oh, I got to use up this fresh, this fish now. And so that's when I start using my older frozen salmon for like some fish pie or chowders and that kind of thing. But that fish is like a fully different experience than it's June. I just opened my grill. I have a filet of Copper River salmon that I could barely afford and I'm, like, going to grill it for, like, six and a half minutes so it's translucent in the center. Like, that is a whole different thing. Everything about living in, and eating in Alaska is seasonal like that. Um, so we have a time of abundance and a time of longing, and that's what our food culture is about. Yeah, too much salmon in the freezer sounds like a pretty good problem to have. It's – as a – person raised Catholic, it does have a lot of guilt attached to it, but <laughs> if you don't eat it fast enough, but yeah. <laughs> so you said seven minutes is a good thing to pay attention to. Do you have another method for, is it done? Do you flake it? What do you? Okay. Well, we should talk about worms for a minute. It's a, it's a thing no one likes to talk about, but there are more parasites in salmon than there used to be because the parasites that are in salmon come from the marine mammals that we have protected. So you might find a parasite looking fish worm in your salmon. Like, don't freak out. I know it's just like, try to block it out, whatever. But um, 
because it comes from the wild, it is part of wild systems, including the one that passes parasites from host to host. Um, and, uh, and so if you find that, just remove the parasite. Um, it's probably not going to do, you know, chances are you're not the designated host for that parasite. So chances are it's not going to do anything to you. People in Alaska who eat a ton and ton and ton of raw or undercooked salmon sometimes have more problems than, you know, other people. But in general, don't flip out about that. So that's one thing. You know, I prefer to cook my salmon to about 110 degrees, and I use a thermometer, and that is pretty rare by most people's Mm -hmm. standards, but fresh salmon cooked to that temperature is pretty delicious in my mind. I like to, this is a Kenji Lopez thing, but I really like to salt the filet, let it dry out in the refrigerator, and then I like to sear it on high heat on the crust on the crust on the skin and then flip it and then get using a thermometer get it to 110 degrees and serve it that way but not everybody likes salmon that temperature and some people like to add five or ten degrees but like just do everyone a favor and don't overcook your fish use a thermometer yeah and i think that that's an important point what you said about you know, the salting, but also could be just kind of like what to do when you get it home from the store, right? Because, you know, you don't have to leave it in the package. Actually dry aging it, leaving it open in the refrigerator will preserve it for longer than if you're not going to be eating it right that night. Yeah. Take it out of the package and pat it dry. Yep. And then like the same is true of like a chicken that you get, like pat that thing dry and leave it uncovered in the refrigerator. Don't freak out. But that's, like, a better thing to do. Like, there was that one, like, Helen Helen Rosner was, like, hitting it with a high-end blow dryer. Like, don't do that to fish. <laughs> that would be weird. But people do that with salmon. But that thing of, like, creating this sort of quasi pellicle on the outside of fish before you cook it is, like, kind of brilliant, I think. Mm-hmm. But look up. Kenji Lopez knows how to do it. I just – I follow his method, and I really like it. I was doing something like that, but I wasn't salting it. And the salt really, like, takes it over the top, I think. Awesome. And – just as we wind down, of course, I want to keep thinking about how to eat salmon. But I I also remember that you mentioned in your article, Teresa Peterson, she was the fisheries policy director for the Alaska Marine Conservation Council. And she talked about how eating the salmon gives you a taste for the place that it comes from, the wild salmon, in this case, the cold waters around Alaska. And she also said that it can give eaters a stake in protecting Alaska's unique environment. Can you talk a little bit about that, the relationship between the fisheries and those who have and do steward the environment that supports them? That is like a multi-pronged answer that I could give you, but there is a pretty well-supported theory in the world of conservation that if you have a direct connection to a place, you're more likely to want to preserve it. So sometimes people, like whenever I write a story for the New York Times, I'll, like most of the comments are like, we should stop eating salmon. But if we stop eating salmon, harvesting and eating salmon, there's, you know, no one, the stake in salmon is reduced. People's connection to the resource is reduced. All the salmon that is caught, like commercial fishing helps to pay for research into salmon, which is another thing because Alaska's fisheries are really, you know, there is a complex scientifically minded framework for managing salmon in Alaska that has taken into account all of the lessons and failures of the previous rest of the entire planet when it comes to managing salmon. Because you have to understand, like salmon used to be everywhere and it is We have been, and salmon lived for, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years through ice ages and warming periods, but human involvement with salmon has reduced it to basically being in Alaska. (laughs) Um, So using all those lessons, we have created a management framework that is really focused on sustaining the resource, but to support that management framework, you have to, you know, eat salmon and buy salmon so that there is a market to fish salmon because it is the fishing that supports the management, if that makes any sense. So sort of a complicated symbiotic relationship is going on there. Mm -hmm. Julia, do you have any final thoughts about wild salmon that you feel like listeners definitely need to know? I guess, like, you know, we kind of get this idea when we go to the store and there's, like, incredible abundance in the world of protein that 
that these kind of things are every day. And wild salmon is not every day. Wild salmon is special. And I think it's important to kind of think about that when you're planning out, you know, I'm going to make salmon, whatever it is. When you choose wild salmon, you're you're choosing something that's special and connected to Alaska and Alaskans. And so just to kind of treat it like that, like a special food that is maybe celebratory or, you know, just something that you might think about when you're eating it. You know, that's kind of how I treat salmon. But if you're looking for a way to think about it, that might be a way. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. We've been listening to journalist, author, and recipe developer, Julia O'Malley. Thank you for joining us today at Eat, Drink, Think. If you liked this episode, be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to pick up your local Edible magazine. You can find show notes for today's episode at ediblecommunities.com. 